Victoria's changed a lot since she learned to drive. She always stayed in the house, watched the TV upstairs, video or read, or wrote to pen friends. She had a lot of pen friends in those days. She never went out. <laughs> Once she got the car, that was that it. Was her life, thing. her life changed literally overnight. I used to look out my bedroom window and gaze longingly at this beautiful shiny red XR2 and I used to think, you know, like in Wayne's world, oh, one day she will be mine. And when I got to hear that he was selling it, I just went over and made him an offer. I coveted that car for over a year. I envied him for driving a car like that. I don't like debt, and when Victoria took the loan out for the car, I was very worried that it might be too much for her. It's almost as large as our mortgage. Also, I thought it might encourage her to drive a lot more and use more petrol, and more petrol means more emissions, etc., you know, and people do drive around too much, and it's not good. My parents don't really like the idea of me going out in my car so much. They'd rather I saved the money from the petrol and paid off my debts. I just wish she'd shut up. I really love fluffy dice. They're very tacky, but I like them. That's why I like them, because they're so tacky. I've got a, an Alpine sticker on my back windscreen. I haven't got an Alpine stereo, but it like looks good. Eh? Uh -huh. And I've got this colour-coded car wax that I use on my car to make it really gleam. Because I think my XR2 has got to shine. It gets you out the house. You know, like when I'm at work, all day I spend looking forward to it. The, the hours can't pass quick enough for me. As soon as I get in from work, I have my dinner, have a bath, maybe watch some TV, do my makeup and my hair, then I'm out, I hit the streets. I cruise about the town, the main street, park up in the car park. It's just part of my life and I love it. I wouldn't swap it for anything. My parents think I'm stupid, they can't see the fascination with going out in your car every night, but I love it. I don't think I could live without it at the moment. <laughs> They're under control in the house. I don't mean control under your thumb. I just mean you know where they are. And these days, an awful lot of things can happen. Maybe they always could, but you worry more now. Things seem to be a little bit worse, perhaps. She's all right, and she's sensible. Victoria's very sound, basically. This is the Burger King car park. This is where everybody comes down on the night. They've all got to hear about Burger King. It's sort of like created its own legend. Practically everybody who's anybody comes down here. It's like you get a, a buzz, it's like a high from just coming down here and meeting folk and just driving about. And the reactions that you get from being in your car, it's brilliant. I don't really flog my car. I'm a girl racer who doesn't race. I uh, talk to all the people I know down here. I just drive past them and wave or flash or peep the horn. But I always come down here. I can't really avoid it. I can't keep away from the place. When I'm young and I'm stupid, I'm going to be coming down here and having a laugh and having fun because I'm going to be old for a very long time. I could be run over by a bus tomorrow. So I want to live tonight.
Well, I would like to think that Victoria in 10 years' time would be a very different person, a progression of uh, perhaps maybe one day she'll be married, children. Yeah, married a children. A career. Some beat up old estate car. Yes. Our priorities will change totally. And she won't be cruising. It'll pass. Oh, yes, as well. <laughs> the Beatle was delivered to the pub where I was working and about an hour left and I was like really waiting for the time to go by really quickly because I was really looking forward to driving my car. Eventually I got out and I took it for a drive around Bradford and it was just one of the most amazing days of my life. It was everybody looking at it. I had a really, really good time just driving around with the stereo on full blast. It was a really nice day, so I wound the roof back up there. It was just totally, totally brilliant. You know, the car was absolutely perfect. It was shining. The engine was in tip-top condition. Everything was just perfect. All through my life, I've looked at other people's Beatles and really been envious of them. And... Eventually, it was my turn to get one of my own. Now, I know the car looks brilliant to look at, but underneath, it's absolutely rotten. In fact, the only thing that works in it now is the clock. I thought, when Chris said he, he, he wanted a car, that he should buy something like a Maestro, because the... It would have been cheaper than the, the car he bought for the for the same year. The parts would have been a lot cheaper, and I think it would have kept its value better as well. My dad's a totally different person to me. He does everything different to me. For instance, he's a teacher, he votes Labour and he stays in at night and watches documentaries. I vote Conservative, I like to go out to the pub and have a good time. But most of all, I'd never ever drive a Volvo Estate. Because for me, it's the worst sort of car you could drive. So dependable, so boring. And I hope I never ever own one. I was driving down Great Orton Road, which is about a mile away from here, and suddenly I just fell back in my seat. And what had happened was the seat had actually fallen through the um, floor of the car, and the car was like in a real mess. I saw that the floor had been made out of um, molten fiberglass and just been spread on the floor. There was no metal there at all, so the car was in a real state. So I got the car repaired. It cost a couple of hundred pounds, which Again, didn't seem that much, because I've got such a bargain when I bought the car. But then a couple of months later, I was all ready to take the car to the Glastonbury Festival. This was last June. And I was really, really looking forward to it. And they just took it down to the garage, because there'd been a few more knocking noises. They looked underneath, and they, they were just laughing, because the car was just knackered. Absolutely knackered. The front end had just collapsed, and it was, like, undrivable. It would have been dangerous to take it outside Bradford, let alone 250 miles down to Glastonbury. So I was just devastated, it totally put a downer on my life. I lent Chris about £1,500 to buy the car and he still owes me about £800. He started off paying it off very well um, until he lost his job in the summer holidays and since then we haven't had anything at all.
My dad never stopped nagging me about the car. Just totally car, car, car all the time. It wouldn't go. It would go, but it just banged, banged, banged. And things just got worse, you know. I mean, if I had somewhere else to live, I would have moved out of the house. Things got that bad. But it made me do all stupid menial tasks around the house and things. Last summer, it made me build a wall in the garden. I'd never built a wall before. And I don't know how he expected me to do it, but it just paid me something really ridiculous. It took about four days to do it. God knows what I was doing. Then he made me paint the garage. and Really stupid tasks like digging the garden and stuff. You know, really degrading for about two pounds an hour. Real downer, totally. Everyone in our family is really different. My mum and myself are not very sporty at all. I mean, I personally can't stick sport. I only do it to stop me getting a beer belly. My brother's quite a top table tennis player. He's about, I don't know, number 10 in the country, maybe. So my, obviously my dad's really, really proud of his achievements. But I think I've achieved quite a lot too. I've started up as a DJ and I'm, you know, I'm doing all right up in the North East. I'm earning some money and I'm having a really good time. My dad doesn't seem to be really bothered about what I'm doing. He never buys me any, any equipment like CDs and stuff. But my brother gets bought stuff like um, table tennis bats and tracksuits and things all the time. And they cost hundreds of pounds and it really cheeses me off that I get nothing while my brother gets everything. I wish they'd just, like, write off the debt or something, you know. Cos, I mean, £750, all right, it's a fair amount of money, but, I mean, it's the sort of debt that they could afford to write off. I mean, it's only, like, five tracksuits and two table tennis bats. I think the main effect it's had is that we can't really talk about it anymore. Cos as soon as I mention his, his episode with the car, then he just blows up and shouts at me and... Um, that's the end of it, really, unless we want to go on shouting. It must be a real downer for my mum and dad because they're, like, leaving the house every morning they see the car and they're grumbling about it. And evidently, people have been saying to my mum that the car's cheesing them off outside the house. I mean, they can all piss off for all I can. I'm not really bothered, you know? It's their tough shit. I don't think I'll ever regret not buying a Maestro because they're just the most boring cars in the world. If I'd bought one, I'd still have it on the road now, fair enough, but I wouldn't have had the good times in my Beetle. I look back on my Beetle as a part of my life that went wrong, but while it did last, it was really good. And I'll never forget that first car. I drove on my own was on the day I passed my driving test on this very road I went to pick up my brother Oliver from school um, and I was so nervous when I was driving along I was looking in my mirror all the time and checking everything holding on to the steering wheel like it was a life support machine and um, when I got there Oliver wasn't at all happy to see me in fact he didn't talk to me all the way home because I could drive and he couldn't and he was really miffed <laughs> My brother Oliver and I used to have the most almighty rows about Mum's Metro because he decided that he needed to drive it all the time and I needed to drive it all the time and Daddy got a bit fed up of it. And at the same time, a friend of mine was moving and needed to sell her car and get something more grown up. So my father bought him for me. I like being at home, I like being with my parents. 
I like I like being in my flat, but I prefer really to be at home. Um, and um, I think this this sort of brought me out of myself a lot. It hasn't changed my personality at all, but it's changed my independence. I'm far more independent than I used to, independent than I used to be. It's given me um, a new lease of life. I know very little about cars. I know that the engine's in the front, and I know that it's called a bonnet, but I don't have a clue how to get it up. And I know that you put your shopping in the back. <laughs> and I don't know an awful lot else about them, really. And so, well, I never, I know, oh, what was that? Dream to look, do you think that was my car? I never dreamed to look at the petrol gauge anyway. I know we're full now. I fill it up when I go home. Daddy fills it up. Daddy had a friend over staying from France and he said, um, Oh my goodness, what a pile of rubbish. And I said to him, It isn't rubbish. I love it. And he, he said, Quite frankly, I would rather walk. Than go in this pile of crap. <laughs> so I said to him, well, the only thing that's wrong with the car is that it's French. About three months ago, I was driving back from Bedford one afternoon, one Sunday afternoon, and the car got slower and slower and slower and it wouldn't go up any hills and in the end I ground to a halt in Toddington service station, called the AA, told them I was a woman on my own, told them exactly what was wrong with it and they, um, they came out and it turned out that I hadn't actually put any oil in the car, which is a bit of a problem and the whole of the inside had scrunkled up. <laughs> so Daddy had to know about this obviously because it cost £97 to get it mended or £99 or something and he... Um, wasn't that happy as he'd already taught me to put oil in it he, he just stood over the top of me and every time I tried to make up a good excuse he sat and stood there and went shh not a happy bunny I think Brian is a car which suits me completely. Sort of a bit scatty, funny looking. He's not grown up at all. Um, and I'm not grown up at all. I'm not bothered about becoming grown up. I don't think I could cope with the responsibility. I imagine myself driving a great big Land Rover or Range Rover with oodles of children and dogs in the back. And um, I imagine that I, no, I hope that I'll be married to Chris. <laughs> but at the moment, he can't commit himself to a night out, never mind marrying me. So we'll have to see. That's my house.
The first car I bought was actually a blue Ford Fiesta, which was an E-Reg car. Um, I paid two and a half thousand pounds and I bought it from a local garage in Pudsey. Now, me and my friends, there was five of the friends, I was the first out of them to actually get a car and to pass a driving test. It was a fairly basic car, it wasn't outrageous, but it was in really good condition, it had a really good stereo and it went well. Um, and it made my life a lot easier. And at first I think my friends maybe were envious, but it soon came to their advantage and they got their uses, as did I. On our street, it used to be a play area where children were safe to kind of play. There used to be benches, trees, flowers, but I mean, now it's just like a rubble kind of dead end road. To be honest, without a car, you are very limited because there's not a lot of things really you can do in army. So, I mean, to have a car really does take the boredom out of being young. Neither my mum or dad can drive, um, so really making the fact that I could drive and I had the car made it a lot more easier for them, um, for convenience. I mean, I'd take my mum shopping on a Thursday to Morrison's, pick her up from Bingo on a Friday, um, and it was like a taxi service. And when we had our family holiday that year, we went to Great Yarmouth and we was able, you know, to go in the car, which was good for me because it was experience, and that was 230 miles. So it was really convenient for them, really, to have the car, and they did feel proud. And, I mean, they benefited from it. One Wednesday morning when I was running extremely late for work, I was just in so much of a hurry to get to work. I just automatically got my hairbrush, got my spot cream and got into the car and I just really wanted to get to work as quick as I can. Now at that time I actually had a Jason Donovan kind of hairstyle which it was an absolute nightmare to kind of set and comb and everything. And I was in the car, I was trying to do my hair, put my spot cream on and just look presentable for work, when all of a sudden I realised I'd just gone straight into the back of a lorry, which, I mean, it was just so, so much of a nightmare. And I'd gone under the lorry and I stayed in the car for about five minutes and then I got out and I assessed the damage and I just couldn't believe it because the all of the front car had come up and it was just a complete write-off. And it was just such a nightmare that I'd lost the car, basically. At the time, I was working in a travel agency and I was earning a wage of 5,500. 5, now, I got the loan from the bank for two and a half thousand pounds and after crashing the car, I half expected I wouldn't have to pay it back. So I went in to see them, explained I had only third party fire and theft insurance and kind of, you know, said to them what can be done and they kind of said, well, I'm sorry, it's kind of tough. You've crashed your car and you've lost your money and you'll still be expected to repay the money. And for the last two and a half years, I've been repaying £75 a month. A few months ago now, I bought this Metro. I paid £250 from my best friend's dad. Now, the Metro has done nothing really for me. I bought it in desperation because I was so desperate, you know, just to get a car and to be back on the road. But since having it, I mean, my friends now have all developed and they've all got nice cars. And I mean, they're just so embarrassed to come into this car because of the kind of old age pensioner image it has. So, I mean, obviously, when we go out there, just say, you know, your cars are no go. And, I mean, in general, putting everything together, it's just an embarrassing car for me to have to drive. <laughs> if 
if I wasn't repaying my £75 a month back to the bank for the loan, there's lots of things really I'd like to buy. I'd buy new clothes and try to, you know, be with the fashion, new LPs, new music. And at the moment I'm actually into theme parks. Um, me and my friend go to quite a lot of the theme parks because there's quite a lot within like a 70 mile radius and I'm really into them. And it's the type of thing where you go and you pay one fee and then all the rides are free all day. So, I mean, I'd take advantage of that more and do more on a weekend, see new things, do new things, as opposed, you know, to be restricted because you just haven't got the money. In 10 years time I'm really hoping to have developed in my career. Now at the moment I'm working as a telephone sales advisor for the Motormark magazine and I've just recently been given um, a position in the special projects department which is interesting. Now all the um, cars the Motormark have are Vauxhalls and hopefully in 10 years I'll have progressed to be the commercial manager of the Motormark and she's actually got the latest model Cavalier SRI which are really really good and they've got kind of every possible refinement so that's definitely what I'm aiming towards getting and I'm looking forward to the years ahead. When you're teenagers especially if you live with your parents it's brilliant having a car, it's essential because then it's like you've got your own flat you've got the radio and you've got heat and you can get all your friends and you can go anywhere We're just mad, we're just lethal we've got everything, we've got music, food and we've got laughter It's like a godsend you know, if I want to go down to the pub, I just get in my car and I go. I went to Birmingham the other day. No problem jumping in the car. Shoot down to Birmingham. I actually managed to get my car because my parents said that if I didn't go to public school anymore and they didn't have to pay £3,000 a term, then they'd agreed to buy me, I quote, a cheap runaround. So I got my car that way. We were all in Switzerland driving over the Alps and James was five at the time and suddenly out of the blue he said, when I'm grown up I want a Porsche and my husband said, good gracious no, I'd never buy you anything like a Porsche, I should buy you something nice and safe like a Volvo and the sulky little voice said, I don't want a Volvo, I want a Porsche and my husband said, well a Volvo's all you'll ever get out of me and for a couple of minutes there was silence and then he piped up and said, I'll wait till you're dead and I'll sell the Volvo and buy a Porsche and we all thought, outrageous little beast. Unfortunately, things are now much more serious. The reason I got my car in the first place was basically, we've lived abroad all our lives, and my father always promised we'd move back to England when my grandfather died, which sure enough he did. So, you know, once he'd sort of popped his clogs, we, we had this house, um, which he did up for about a year, and he then decided he wanted to sell it because he got a rather encouraging offer. And as a form of bribe, he offered my sister and I flats and cars. And sure enough, you know, we never saw the flats and we got fairly shafted on the cars. It was a pity, actually, because we really did desperately want a family home, you know. My husband offered James an upgrade on his car for his 21st birthday. And James took upgrade to be something snazzier, something a bit faster, something sleeker, something more in tune with his image. And my husband had a complete different interpretation. He thought upgrade was something bigger, solider, safer, 
He kept saying, more metal around you. And there was absolutely no meeting of minds at all. And they just bellowed at each other angrily for two months. The one stipulation my father actually had when, when he was saying what I could buy car-wise was that I was just not allowed a GTI, whatever happens, in a, regardless of car, as long as it's not a GTI. Because anything he understands about cars, the GTI means speed, which means death. So sure enough, I went out to Renault, my mother, and we discovered the Renault Clio 16V, which means 16 valve, which is, you know, the most lethal car ever. It's equivalent of a GT Turbo. And so sure enough, I went back and I said, look, Dad, you know, honestly, it's, it's a 16V. It's, it means, you know, it's got better seat covers and electric windows and that sort of thing. And he was like, oh, fine, fine, OK, that sounds exactly right. You know, you crack on sort of thing. Sure enough, we bought it. He then came in and saw these three oil pressure gauges and went absolutely berserk, I mean, apoplectic, thinking, you know, because he'd seen those in Aston Martin. And it was, it was a horror. And when he hears this, I'm going to be in all sorts of trouble as well. My sister was extremely jealous of, of the 21st situation. She got a watch, I mean, a very fine watch. I got a car. And as a result, she feels extremely hard done by. She lives in Fulham and comes from this rather sort of Fulham bunch who are very, very nice. And I come from a Chelsea bunch, which is rather more smooth. My friends on the whole are staggeringly rich. I don't mean that sound obnoxious, but a lot of them have household names, whether they'd be chocolate manufacturers or not. And as a result, it's very difficult to compete and, I mean, there's no competition against BMWs and Mercedes, age 19, 20, whatever. But at the same time, I did want to sort of, you know, keep my end up slightly and try not to let the side down. And, yeah, this car seemed reasonable enough, really. This is the King's Road, which is my home turf. So sort of stomping ground. So I've been coming here since I was 13. Love it. Go to all the clubs, all the pubs. Everyone I know hangs out here or lives in Chelsea or Kensington, I suppose, but certainly this is where most people congregate. Sadly, I mean, the problem with the King's Road at the moment is that it's 11.30 in the morning. So all these people you see around here are just sort of weekend rabble who are coming shopping. But I love the King's Road. I mean, I don't shop here, but this really is my stamping ground. Absolutely home away from home. My father and I have a rather strange relationship. I mean, there's some love, but basically love skips generation and it's mainly based on money. It's a sort of financial situation whereby we have a sort of deal rather than a particularly affectionate relationship. Well, this is something which he proudly tells me anyway, but it's difficult really. And um, as a result, we, we fight. I mean, he thinks I'm a wastrel and I think he's, you know, unnecessarily unpleasant. I'm gonna get in so much trouble when he watches this, I really am. Being a car thief isn't saying that you go to college and learn. You don't get sitting gills in it. Basically, you just pick it up as you go along. Any car that was new that came out, you try it out and you get quicker and quicker at it. I mean, towards the end of, they were bringing these Cavaliers out with deadlock systems and that, which are no good. And they were saying that they're impossible to break into. And in the end, I was getting into them within about six seconds. I don't feel as a mother that I went wrong in any way with Craig. Considering he was brought up without a dad, all three of them being brought up without a dad. So I don't blame me 
And I don't really blame Craig. I'll blame the car. When I come home from work, I rush in, have a bath, get dressed and I rush back out again. I don't even sit in and have dinner or watch telly. I just like to be able to get out of the house, get in my car and drive. I've always been attracted to cars from a really young age. I mean, even from being in my dad's car, he used to let me just steer the car into the garage before he was pulling up and parking. I used to get a real good kick out of that. I used to really enjoy it, just sitting on his lap and steering the car. When I was at school, I'd like to always be the one that had everything. Even till now, if my mate's got a Pioneer stereo, I want to get an Alpine. A friend of mine had, had a Mark I Escort. I had an XR2. Now I've sold me XR2. I've got a Renault 5 GT Turbo. I always like to be one up from everyone else. Sounds big-headed, but it's just the way I like to be. This is what uh, basically we call the Mad Mile. Most car thieves, otherwise me, used to race down here as fast as we can. And I'd like see how fast we can get out of any of the cars that we have. It's otherwise known as Sick Up Bypass. You used to race down here as quick as you can, see how fast you get before you get to the bottom turning. Just after the bottom bend, there's a bridge. We used to get about 120, 130 out of most cars down here. Uh, the road has basically claimed a lot of lives through people racing as fast as they can and losing control just on this bend that we're approaching here. Just as you come round this bend, we used to get between 80 and 100 basically. And you get a lot of kids that uh, and lose it, take the bend too tight, smack straight into that bridge there. When I had the crash in the Montego, it really scared me. It shook me right up. I didn't, didn't think I'd actually go back to driving for a little while, because I broke my leg in the crash. And it sort of gave me another a view of looking at things because I hurt someone else in a crash. And uh, that's really one of the main things that stopped me from nicking cars, really. It made me think twice because I, I hurt someone else and also I hurt myself. And that's when I actually thought to myself, this has got to stop. Ever since I've gone on the straight and narrow, I've had nothing but a hard time from everybody because they say a leopard never changes its spots. But I think I'm just one of those strange leopards. I think in 10 years time, Craig will be driving a, a bigger and a better car and he'd be living in a penthouse. He'd like to live in a penthouse. This is what he's always telling me. Mother, when I get old enough, or when I've got enough money, he said, I'm gonna be living in a penthouse. That's all good. I'll come and visit you, you can give me some tea.
when I got in the car, a lot of my friends basically told me that um, you've got to be careful. All the girls are going to want you for your car and not for you. But I don't think that would be true. My beetle is a bonus in attracting the boys. They all want to know me more and give me more attention. The roof came off the house when I told my parents I was buying an XR2. I, they thought I was going to kill myself. I was too young to realise the dangers. And my parents went mad. My parents are very worried about me being alone in the car. They usually give me a time that I have to be home by in the evenings. And a few minutes after that is the time that I know that they're going to call the police. The car was bought because she'd done ever so well in her E-level results. And secondly, I thought it'll give her a good deal of independence when she's at college. Why I went along with James was because she, she'd chosen to go to a Scottish university, Edinburgh. And she, she was an asthma, she is still an asthma sufferer. And you can put a coat on Victoria, but she doesn't always remember to, to button it up. But she's got to close the car door. Buying me the car was a little bit like wrapping me up in cotton wool when they had to let go of me, when they had to send me off to university. And it's like their protective shell around me still. I suppose it's their way of giving me a licence to freedom. In the Woody Allen film, Play Against Sam, he places things around his flat to impress a girl and I do the same thing in my car, not to impress anyone, but I think just to create an image that I'm into the things I'm into. There's a map of France in the, the side pocket because well, I haven't ever been there in my car, but I'm going there one day. It makes me feel much more grown up and in control and free and stuff and I can do what I want when I want. I can go off places at the drop of a hat and don't have to tell anyone and that's just great. And, and also it makes me feel kind of mature in a secure way, like going to this going to the supermarket. I absolutely love going to the supermarket and loading up the back with the shopping bags. I like that. I'll get over it, I know I will when I have to do it enough times, but at the moment it feels, it feels dead mature. Before I had the car, I had the most beautiful old framed bicycle. I still got it, but it's a really touchy emotional subject because the car has replaced the bike and like, it's, I just think all the time, what, car, bike, car, bike, what am I going to take? And it's always car. I had an accident coming back from Edinburgh last term and it felt as if I was betraying my parents' trust in me. I was, um... When I, when I hit what I hit, it was like ramming mum and dad. And... You know, I wanted them to be angry with me, but, you know, to shout at me and say, how could you do this? We gave you this beautiful car and you, and you screw it up. But they weren't, they were great. They were just, as long as I was okay, that's all they were worried about, which I expect is how anyone would really react. But I wanted them to be angry because I was so angry at myself. My parents and me are really close. In fact, I'd say almost too close. 
our apron strings are tied way too tight. I thought that saying goodbye for the first time, going off to university, would make every subsequent time easier, but it's really just made it harder. The day I passed my driving test was the happiest day of my life. Oh, what a rush. I knew I'd passed mine, I just knew I would do it. And when I did, I thought, that's it. <laughs> I'm off. From a journey of discovery to gridlock, speed traps and necessity, Tristram Hunt explores the evolution of a very British pastime next tonight in a brand new series. The joy of motoring begins in a few moments. <laughs> 